give me a thumbs up when we're ready. Well, good morning, and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Welcome to our first non-in-person service of 2021. Yes, non in, no, no one's here, folks. Just myself and my wife, who's running the sound system. This message today is going to be on a test of faith, so I think this will be a test of faith uh, for me and myself. You know, it's kind of funny as we get into this, right? At the beginning of this virus, when this whole thing happened, the week I became the full-time pastor, it was that week we went to non-in-person services. We were shut down. Now we hit 2021, and I'm in close contact with someone with the virus. Though I'm not sick, I'm shut down. I'm quarantined. So we are having a non-in-person service this week. It's a test of faith. You know, in reality, this is a pretty easy test for us to endure, I think. It really isn't that hard, but uh, it sure does, uh, sure does make you aware of things, I think. Yes, but uh, so I'm speaking to an empty room again. It's not empty. My wife is with me, and clearly God is always with us at all times. But we're doing this. We want to be in complete compliance with all the CDC guidelines and the Department of Public Health and Massachusetts guidelines. So we're doing that. We're staying above reproach. We want to care for each other in all instances as best as we possibly can. So this week, there's no one here. And we'll see how my tests come out, right? We'll see if I pass the test or fail the test. It's a test of faith. It's also a test of the medical community. But uh, it, testing, it happens all the time. We're tested all the time. But when you think about it, you are strengthened by testing. We give all of our children in school tests all the time. Why? We don't give children tests in school to be mean to them. You need to test and see whether they've gained knowledge about what they're studying and understanding what they're going through. It's very important. Elsewise, they won't know if they're learning either. It's very important. It's caring and loving to give tests. It helps people. Testing's found all throughout the Bible. Faith. Faith is tested. And things are recorded in the Bible for our learning and our edification. In Proverbs 17, 3, it says, The crucible is for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. <laughs> so our text today we're going to about to have up here, and uh, we'll take a look at our, uh, we can take a look at our title slide now, uh, is uh, our text is going to resolve around a test of faith of a woman that's going to be tested by Jesus. So let's read our text as we go through this. We're in Matthew chapter seven, uh, 15, verses 21 to 28. I'm going to read the text. I'm going to go through it. And then we're going to display the text verse by verse. We're going to go through the text. So here we go in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21. Then Jesus went out from, that, from there to, and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the re that region and cried out to him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. His disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I, will not, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of, of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered her and said, It is not good to take bread, children's bread, and throw it to little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this. This day that we can come together, Lord, we're not together in the building, Lord, but come together in your word. Thank you for this test of faith that we get as a church, Lord. We're always being tested. You are always refining us. It's so important. We thank and we praise you, Father. Let us have a worshipful heart towards you at all times. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So now, let's get into our text. Let's get into our text. Let's take it apart verse by verse. As we look at our text, There's a cry for help by this woman, a cry for help. She says, then Jesus went out, went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed of demons, 
demon-possessed. This is, this is quite a situation he's in. And where are they? What are they doing? Where are they? They are in this region on this map as we look at it. This is Israel at the time when Jesus was there in this area. You can see the area of Galilee and Samaria and Judea. That would more or less comprise Israel. But to the north where there's that red circle, you can see Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon, that region is in our modern day uh, world, that is Lebanon, okay? But Tyre and Sidon is where they went to. And if you recall, not that long ago, uh, we had some messages regarding King Ahab. What did King Ahab do? He went to the region of Sidon, and he got his bride. His bride was Jezebel, Jezebel of all women on the earth, a worshiper of Baal. Her father was the, the king of Sidon, and he brought her back to Israel, and he introduced pagan worship to Baal, Israel. That's what Ahab done, did. This is the region that Jesus and the disciples are there for, went to. It's predominantly a Gentile land. Are they in the wrong neighborhood? You know, sometimes say, are we in the wrong neighborhood? You're never in the wrong neighborhood when you're bringing Christ to that neighborhood because every neighborhood needs Christ. Remember that. Be fearless. Love people in every neighborhood. And why were they there? Well, oddly enough, they needed rest. In, 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 in the, in the, uh, the complementary gospel in Mark, it says, and they entered a house and wanted no one to know it but they could not be hidden. You see, Jesus and the disciples, they've been down in Galilee, by the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. They've been in disputes with the Pharisees regarding defilement. And Jesus explained to the Pharisees, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, but what comes out of them. It's what comes out of our heart that defiles a person. Needless to say, this did not go over well with the Pharisees. But it seems as they were tired and they wanted a rest, a reprieve from the embattlement with the religious leaders. So they went to this area. They went to this area. They went there to escape to get a rest, but you know, for Jesus, there's really no escaping the crowds. Everyone wants him. And who is this woman? This woman that sh cries out, right? She's, she's, she's chasing him, if you will. What is she? She's a, a, she's a Syrophoenician, because she's from the area of Syrophoenicia by birth. She's a Canaanite. She's a Gentile. She's a Gentile. Now remember the Canaanites. the Canaanites. The Canaanites occupied Israel, the promised land, before uh, God delivered the promised land to Israel itself. They were a pagan people. They were cursed people. They were cursed because Noah cursed, Ham, cursed his grandson Canaan, the son of Ham, years before. We don't know the, the exact details of why he was cursed. It's hard to discern from the word of God. It's in Genesis 9. But the point being, the Canaanites were a cursed people. They were deeply set in pagan worship. But you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, there's only one place you can go for mercy. This woman wants mercy. It's to the tabernacle. It's to the temple. It's to the mercy seat of God. The seat occupied in the Holy of Holies. Mercy can only be found with God. And this woman, this Canaanite woman, she's figured this out. She knows this. So that's the setting. This is where they're at. And this Canaanite woman is crying out for mercy. Her daughter, imagine this, her daughter is demon-possessed. Demon possession can be manifested in many different ways. I am far from an expert on demon possession, okay? But I did study it to a certain extent for this message because it, it's crucial to this. Demon possession, there could be physical impairments and manifestations that cannot be attributed to any physiological source or problem that we can see. There could be personality changes, depression, aggression, supernatural strength, immodesty, antisocial behavior, Perhaps the ability to share information that there is no way of naturally knowing this. Now, it's important to note that all or nearly all of these things I've just mentioned, these characteristics, do have other explanations. So it's important that we not label every person that is depressed, a person that has a convulsion, that is epileptic. They are not all demon-possessed. 
there's great discernment with this. We know from the medical uh, information that we have that these conditions exist. But on the other hand, our Western culture probably does not take satanic involvement in people's lives seriously enough. Perhaps societally, we've come to accept demonic activities as normal. Remember the people in Ephesus? Think of what was the normal in Ephesus. The temple priestesses were prostitutes. Magic and divinity were the normal of the day. When things get normalized, it doesn't make them right. And those things aren't normalized. Well, Jesus has a track record on casting out demons. And there's one. In Luke chapter 8, it says, A certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, called Mary, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So first and foremost, contrary to popular belief, okay, Mary was not a prostitute. There's no example of any immorality of Mary of Magdalene in the Bible. It's just not there. She had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. She was actually a person of means. She, and she's the first person that Jesus appeared to after he arose from the, from, from the tomb. She and many other women, they provided, they, they, they supported the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. That's what they were doing. Mary of Magdalene and these women, sort of in a manner of speaking, they put their money where their mouth was because they knew that the ministry would take money. And so they gave of their substance. They were women of substance that were giving to the work of God. These women are examples of what happens when Jesus touches your life. They were compelled to serve him at any cost. They really were. Just remember this. It's these women, these women, they stood by Jesus when he was on the cross, right? The women were by him at the cross. Only one apostle. Nowhere to go. This Canaanite woman, she has nowhere to go. Think about it. Where's she going to go? She's going to go make a sacrifice to a pagan god? People that worship pagan gods of wood and stone and metal, you know, they really understood more than we give them credit for, I think. Now, perhaps holding an amulet in your hand will give you a little satisfaction if you're upset about something, but let's face it. When you lose the lucky rabbit foot, it's lost. People aren't foolish. They really aren't. Idol worship was really conformist and oppressive. Pagan worship is the antithesis of Christianity. Coming to God is an act of faith and of trust. Coming to Christ is a decision a person makes. They must, they must, by their own will, come to Christ. There can be no coercion in coming to Christ. The statement stands true. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Remember that. You can't make someone be a Christian. It needs to come from their heart. Now, what did they do? The, the disciples, they wanted to send her away. We look in our text, as we step through our text. In verse 23, it says, but he answered, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. Her cry goes unanswered by Jesus. <laughs> now we have a real test, don't we? Wow. And Jesus' silence, it was a trigger to his apostles, to his disciples. They're thinking, oh, he disapproves of this woman. So they want to facilitate the, the issue. Jesus, just send her away. She's calling out after us. She's a bother. You know, the disciples, a disciple is being trained. They're learning, aren't they? They had a couple of other instances, these disciples. Then the disciples, didn't they want to say, send away the little children? In Matthew 13, it says, then children were brought to him that he might lay hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belong to the kingdom of heaven. Come to God, coming as a child, 
brings an untainted faith. Coming as a child shows that the fact that a person is needy, independent, and acknowledges the need for Christ. Pride is set aside. Children are so open regarding their needs, aren't they? They'll embarrass you, right? They'll embarrass you. They're in a grocery store, and a little one's got to go to the bathroom. They'll stop bouncing up and down. Mommy, i got to go pee. They don't care. They know they're supposed to tell mom this. They're just honest. They have a need. They need to have it fulfilled. It's amazing. You know, Jesus told his sheep, those, his followers, to care for the least among them. Think of this Canaanite woman. She truly is the least among them right now. Satan has her daughter. Her daughter is demon-possessed. When we come to Christ, we get to come by faith, humility, and simplicity. Also, to remember the disciples, they want to send away the 5,000. Do you remember that? that? That instance there? And they got to the end of the day. There was too many of them, Jesus. We're at the end of the day. We're in a deserted area. Jesus, just send these people away. Okay, we need to get food ourselves. Jesus says, no, feed them. Could you imagine the disciples there? Understand this, they were being tested. They, really, Jesus? Could you imagine the disciples saying, okay, everyone, sit on the hillside, right? <laughs> the rabbi will take your order soon. They must have been looking at Jesus. Jesus, are you sure about this? Jesus, are you sure? This is kind of crazy. They're going to kill us. Jesus was testing them. It was amazing. It was amazing. And there's tension in the test. Tension in a the test. There's a picture of a classroom, right? Children are in their classroom. They're taking a test. Hopefully these, these children in this slide here, they're studied and they're ready for the test. But even when you study, do you remember if you were in school and a lot of the, all of the children that we have in, in here are still are, are, are in school, there's always some tension for a test. Even if you think you know the material inside out, you still have to sit down and start the test. Well, what do you do when you come to a test that you can't study for, right? The Canaanite woman, she can't be prepared for a demon-possessed daughter, now can she? You know, a parent really can't be prepared for all the choices that their child is going to make. A parent is left to deal with the choices at times. But demon possession, it wasn't a choice, was it? No. This silence, Jesus doesn't answer. What does that mean? When God is silent towards us, he's drawing us nearer and nearer. But he's not answering. That's right, because God wants us nearer and nearer with silence. That's what silence is doing. It's to bring us closer to him. We think it's hard. God means it for good. He wants us. But finally, Jesus does respond to her. He does. When he does, it's a hurtful answer in a manner of speaking. In verse 24, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Whew, that must sting. Think about it. <laughs> that seems heartless, doesn't it? Jesus sounds like a Pharisee here, doesn't it? You're not one of us. Hey, you didn't, you didn't make the grade. You know, the reality of this culture, you really have to understand the culture and the context to really understand what was going on here. Because there's great ethnic divides in this culture. So we need to take care when we look back at these cultures to look at the context of it. Because if we were to look closely at our own culture, which we should, we'll see that there is many things that culturally are completely unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. And why is this Jewish rabbi, this Jesus, why is he going to hear the request of a Canaanite woman? She has two strikes against her. One, she's a woman. And in society, she doesn't have much of a say. Two, she's a Canaanite. She's part of a cursed lineage in this part of the world. Jesus isn't going to listen to her. But isn't it funny when you think about Jesus? You know, he dealt with other Gentiles too. Do you remember the Samaritan woman? No one was supposed to deal with that woman either. Jesus did. Jesus did. Jesus is always seeking out faith and bringing faith to people. The gospel is to the whole world. That's what it is. So why is he going to deal with this Gentile when we know he's looking for the lost sheep of Israel? 
The reason is because this woman is being tested. The divide that is perceived okay between the Jews and the Gentiles really is not okay with God. God made Israel a light to the Gentiles. This is really unacceptable. And this exchange takes place. We continue on our text to verse 25. Her cry for help. This woman is looking for help. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, help me. You know, I was going through this message, and that, that hymn came to mind. Do you know, you know that hymn? It says, it says, come, now is the time to worship. You know that one? This is her time to come and worship. We need to come and worship. That hymn goes on. It says, come, now is the time. It says, come, now is it, come just as you are to worship. Come just as you are to worship in that hymn. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. Because it's not about the clothing. It's not about the location. It's not about cleaning up your act first before you come to Jesus. Jesus told the Samaritan woman as well, you need to come and worship him in spirit and truth. It didn't make any difference what mountain or what you did in spirit and in truth. Now think about this woman, her plight for a moment. Think about it, okay? If this is me, if this is me, okay, and I was just rejected out of hand the way this seems, I'd probably become angry. You just blew me off. I can't believe you just said that. I asked you for help sincerely, and you, you just cast me to the side. You know what? Anger's not a luxury that she has. She really doesn't. Her daughter cannot afford her mother's feelings getting hurt. What do we do when our feelings get hurt sometimes? We get angry. We take it personally. Let me tell you what. If it's not righteous anger, if it's not righteous anger, just let it go. Just let it go. We need to put this anger aside in our lives. Note as well that this woman, she acknowledges him as Lord and Son of David. In her request, she worshipped him. She's humble. She's contrite. She's vulnerable. She is vulnerable. As I read this, I'm thinking, Did my, does my worship look like this? Is this what it looks like when I worship? But we continue on. Another hurtful answer, or so it seems. Another answer. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. <laughs> OK. This response seems hard, too. I don't take bread from the children and throw it to dogs. That's the response to help? That can be your thought. That's the response? Context and culture are so important. The Jews considered Gentiles unclean. They labeled them as dogs. That's the label that's assigned to them. That seems hard, right? But we don't live in that culture. Once again, stop judging the culture. We, you know, we need to take care of our own culture. And we just need to see where this is at and how God is glorified through it. That's really the end shot of all this. And who are the children here? Who are the children? Who's bread? It's the children of Israel. At that point in Jesus' ministry, he is training his disciples to bring the gospel to the Jews. That's where they're at. They're, being, they're learning. They're being discipled. They're being trained. Later on, after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit comes on to the disciples, then they are unleashed on the world to the Jews and the Gentiles. But at this point, in their process, in sanctification, in training, they're learning to bring the gospel to the Jews. And remember, Jesus and the disciples, they've traveled out of a predominantly Jewish area. They really have. They're in the minority. But it's not an issue. Because culturally, the social interactions between Jews and Gentiles was already established. But this text is about faith. It's not about culture. The Bible is a book of faith. It's not a book of cultural cuisines. Was she insulted or hurt? No, she wasn't, actually. She just wasn't. She was persistent. Faith is like that, folks. Faith is persistent. And I really want you to think about this for a minute. 
A faith that rolls over at the first sign of resistance is not faith. It's not. If you get resistance and you just say, oh, I can't do this anymore, you don't have faith. That sounds hard, doesn't it? Am I easily hurt? Tell me, who's in your corner? Is Christ in your corner? Are you following Christ? We should have great resilience. Jesus, Jesus stands before us. We continue on, and we see in verse 27, we see the bread of life. The bread of life starts to come out in this whole picture, this whole interaction. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. <laughs> Isn't she persistent? She comes back to Jesus again. She comes back. The Jews get the first piece of bread. She's okay. The gospel, the good news, yeah, I get it. It's to the Jew first. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is everlasting water that you'll never thirst after you have him. It really is. Recall when the 5,000 were fed getting back to bread. It was just bread, right? In one respect. But it was miraculous bread. There was no oven, right? That was his little things that get me. There was no oven. And the people were hungry, and Jesus fed them. When you read the account, and it says explicitly in John 6, 6, that Jesus was testing his disciples. Jesus is always testing, testing his disciples, training his disciples, refining his disciples, testing, refining all the time is what Jesus does to his people, to his sheep. Jesus tells them plainly who he is in John 6, 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. That's who Jesus was. Bread is a subject from the master's table that this woman is concerned about. This woman knows Jesus is the bread of life. She just wants the crumbs. Jesus, you're more than sufficient is what she's saying. She knows this. And she doesn't argue regarding her lot in life. She was born a Canaanite. Yes, I'm a Gentile dog. Okay, I'm not worthy. But Lord, Lord, don't even the little dogs that scamper around the master's table get the leftovers? How powerful is that? How powerful is that? The power of meekness and humility, folks. Meekness and humility is so powerful, exemplified in this Canaanite woman of a cursed line. Recall, that, <laughs> recall when Jesus, when they fed the 5,000? Do you remember what happened afterwards? They collected up 12 baskets of bread, of leftovers. See, the bread supply was inexhaustible, just like God's love is inexhaustible. This woman now, Lord, please, this is my daughter. This is my baby girl. I know I'm a dog. I know where I come from. But can't I at least please have the leftover crumbs? Lord, can I have you? Please have mercy on me. This is hard, isn't it? That's why it's called a test. If it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be a test. She's being refined. She's being refined. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Doesn't your heart go out to this woman in her trial of faith? This woman's suffering. Her faith is being tested. When you squeeze grapes, you get grape juice. When a person of faith gets to squeeze, faith is exhibited. She's getting the squeeze now in this text. Why? I believe this is recorded for you and for me. This is what faith looks like, folks. This Canaanite woman is what faith looks like. She is fearless. She is persistent. She is focused. And she is passionate. She will not relent. Jesus is it. All or nothing. Folks, that's what faith is. It's all or nothing. When Peter stepped out on the water, it was all or nothing. You know, you're going to see in this message, you're going to see attached to this is a little video from Johnny uh, Erickson Tata. 
And I want you to watch it. It's three minutes and 26 seconds. I want you to watch it because she gives an example of faith and suffering. And the reason I want you to watch it is it's, it's relevant to today because Johnny, uh, she got COVID. I understand about Johnny uh, is that she was, became a quadriplegic in her teens. And for like the past 50 years, she's been a quadriplegic. There she is, helpless. When you watch the video, please watch it. She, she's there, and uh, she, she talks about lying in bed, having a hard time breathing, and asking God, why is this happening? Her faith was tested. Watch the video. And finally, she came to peace. She says, God, you're in control. I love you. I'm not going to go into it anymore. I ask you to watch it. Understand that we'll be tested many different ways. But her faith was refined again, as if she hadn't been through enough trials in her life, being a quadriplegic and going through her life. Again, she has a trial of faith. It's amazing. Because she's powerless to take care of herself. You know what, folks? Sometimes we think we just have the power to take care of ourselves. We're a lot more powerless than we think we are. We really are. Hey, I think about that, 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 that Johnny's uh, testimony in this. You know, maybe she was allowed to get COVID. So this, this Canaanite woman interaction, I believe, was recorded for us to see about faith. Maybe Johnny, God had allowed her to, to get uh, COVID as well, to record her experience with it and her test of faith. Her test of faith. Do you have something worth more than your faith in this life? When's the last time you've ever thought about how much your faith is worth? That's something to think about. But for this Canaanite woman, the evidence of things unseen was right in front of her. <laughs> See, all the barriers, all the blockades of the world, culture, and religion were gone for her. That's what faith does. That's what faith does. Faith is an invisible bulldozer. Faith puts people into action. Faith will not let you stand by idly, folks. If you're on the sidelines, you need to ask yourself, do I have faith? I'm just saying. Is our faith being tested? How are we doing? How are we doing? How persistent are we in our faith? Is worship exemplified in our faith like this woman? Is Jesus Lord of our life? like he is the Lord of this Canaanite woman's life. You know, think about it for a minute. You know, we have a society, and as a church, okay, we've been afflicted by over a year by this virus, okay? And the clock's still ticking. What a kicker. Thing just won't go away, huh? The first wave of vaccines are coming out. I got a question for you. Is the vaccine the savior? How's your faith? Sometimes we need to think about this. I think the vaccine's phenomenal. We've got, a, we've, we've got a bouquet of vaccines coming out. I think this is great. But I'm concerned about our faith. I'm concerned about my faith and your faith. Do we think for a moment that God's not aware of this situation? God's permitting this all to happen. Remember, God permitted Satan to abuse Job at incredible levels beyond anything that one could imagine. These interactions between Satan and Job are recorded for our edification as well, just like this Canaanite woman. Now, our trial is going to end at some point. It really will. This is going to get over at some point, but there'll be other challenges. There's always another challenge, folks. That's the point. And you don't have time to study for them. You just don't. Okay? Let's say this challenge of this virus is over, September 18th, 2021. By the way, that's my birthday. Say it's over then. Okay, that's great. I wonder churches across America, will the number of people in the church buildings, will they be above or below the pre-pandemic levels? Because that's important. It really is. You know, I recall I was here when 9-11 happened, terrorist attack on the United States. And what was amazing when 9-11 happened, this instantaneous event, the church building filled up. When we visited people, I told them from the church, they were, they were just about hugging me. You can't hug anyone now. Not allowed. Can't even shake their hands. Got to wear a mask. 
Can't even smile at them. If you do, they can't see. But the pandemic's just different, isn't it? It's quiet. It's silent. It's sort of insidious. It's sort of keeping us all apart. It's different. 9-11, we came together. I remember being in, I was living in Sharon at the time. We came to the, the, the town square. Thousands of people singing and praying of all different stripes of the world. Can't do that with this guy. It's ugly. This virus is just one test. It doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop here. Is there anything in your life that's coming between you and God? That's a question we need to ask. Is there anything that you need to bring to him that's coming between you? Bring to the master. We can't let anything become between us and God. That is so important. If we feel like God has forsaken us, if you feel like God's forsaken you, I want to suggest perhaps that you're putting your feelings before your faith. But it can feel like that sometimes. I'm human. Guess what? It happens to me. That's not what this woman did. She knew that Jesus had the words of eternal life. Where will I go if I don't come worship? I asked myself. What am I going to do? Am I going to go to the beach? Am I going to go to the mountains? Am I going to go off on Sundays and worship the creation rather than the creator? It's funny, huh? I want to suggest to you that the virus isn't the issue because there's always another challenge. Now, we need to be wise during this viral age because God is not done with his church. He is not done with me. He's not done with you. We have a test of faith. So we ask, I ask, are we loving one another the way, in a way that the world would know that we are his disciples? Are we? Is our love like that? Because we're commanded to do that. Because there's rewards for our faith, our final birth. The reward of faith, it's so beautiful. Then Jesus answered her and said, Oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Isn't that beautiful? You see, Jesus was with her the whole way. He was with her the whole way. It was a test of faith. We're going to be tested, folks. We are. Jesus knew her heart. Jesus knows our hearts. So I ask you, what obstacle can be put in our way to stop us from having great faith? I believe we should have great faith. Why shouldn't we have great faith? We will be put in a crucible and refined. We will. Maybe that crucible is a virus. Hey, maybe it's a wayward child in your life, huh? Maybe you lose a loved one. The tests that refine us uh, is more than enough. To, if we, God loves us enough, we'll get through them. Think of this for a moment. If we are not in a crucible being tested, then we are in the world being contaminated. The crucible heats us and burns off the contaminants. The world, in the world, we collect contaminants. We just do. So I'll just leave with this thought. Think of this woman. She's from an idolatrous land, OK, a pagan land. May have worshipped Baal at one point in her life. We don't know. But it should embolden us in our faith. The question is, are we listening to the voice of the shepherd, our good shepherd? Are we listening? Are we hearing what he says? Tests are going to come into our lives. But understand this, folks. They're supposed to come into our lives. They'll refine us. So I just want to say to you this morning, or whenever you're watching this, do not be disheartened when you get into a test. They're going to happen. They're going to happen. We need to hit our knees, and the one who loves us will see, see us through it every single time. I thank you. I thank you for listening, and I hope to see you soon. The virus is just another road bump, folks. We'll get through this, too. God love us all. Thank you.
We're dismissed in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your goodness. You're good to us all the time, Lord. We praise your name. Thank you for the test of faith that you give us and you will be giving us, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. That's the end of our service. Have a great day. God bless.